Okay, hello everyone, welcome. As you just heard, uh, there is a recording in progress. So uh, if you're not comfortable with that, you can, you can always sign off and watch the recording later. Um, you can also turn off your camera if you like. Uh, I'm Melanie Blake, I'm the admin assistant for the World War One HA. And I'm here with, of course, Sal Campagno, the chapter head for the Bay Area and our speaker, Terry Finnegan, um, who we're gonna introduce in just a moment. And as you may have seen from uh, the email announcement. Uh, so of course, everybody was focused on uh, the German invasion of Belgium, but there was a lot more happening, including this story on the Northwest Front, which I, I think many of you might have questions about. What is that Northwest Front? And Terry is going to tell you the story of, of the Russian armies that was, the, that was there. Um, Terry Finnegan is a retired uh, Colonel U.S. Air Force who has more than 50 years of dedicated dedicated service as an Air Force officer, a senior senior civil servant, and a support for the National Guard. And whoops, a little bit of audio coming in there. And uh, he's, I think he's a familiar face to many of you on the, uh, many of you who are World War I enthusiasts, especially for his talks about aviation. Um, and as Sal mentioned, and I think Sal, you're gonna say a few words about this. He also com recently completed the first volume of a four volume series on aerial reconnaissance on the Eastern Front, uh, shooting the front Eastern operations that's coming out this, this fall. Is that right, Terry? Yeah, hopefully before Christmas, if it doesn't make it to fall, but either way it's coming. Cool, and we'll put that up in the chat. So Sal, I'm gonna turn it over to you. All right, well, listen, everyone, thank you very much for attending. And I hope that a few more will be entering us and uh, hearing this uh, presentation by Terry. Terry's been around with us for some time. He's been on the West Coast. He's given deliveries to our group on many subjects, particularly that of um, air reconnaissance. Uh, I urge everyone to go acquire his books because he gives an insight on the relevance of air reconnaissance and its significance in changing the whole picture of World War I and its influence later on through the, sen through the century into World War II and even currently today. So I want to hear what, what Terry has to say about this Russian front. And as usual, we always seem to focus on the Western front. That's where America fought. Um, it's where we get most of the information through our uh, English authors about it, the Western front. But there was an equal important and extensive front in the East. And it's to play an even greater role in World War II. But in World War I, this is an area that we don't know that much about and need to know more about. So I'm going to turn it over to Terry right now. Terry, it's your show. Let's hear your view on this important area of history. Sal, it's always been a pleasure. Thanks so much. Welcome, everybody. Uh, what's happening in front of your screen is you see in a column of Russian soldiers heading into Germany. And a lot of folks don't understand the fact that the Eastern Front basically had more cataclysmic, more decisive maneuvers in the first few days of the Great War than what occurred in the Western Front. And we'll get an appreciation for that as we look at the discussions ahead. So Germany is invaded. And it occurs within the first few weeks of the Northwest Front, which was the which was the Russian command's breakdown for the Eastern Front in total. Okay, let me see if this works. So looking looking at California, for those who live out there, I get an appreciation of the 164,000 miles square miles that California is, and you get an idea of how big the Eastern Front was. Uh, Germany, for example, was only 140,000 square miles. So when you see this, it shows you the immensity of the entire theater of operations. Now, this is a hard to see map because of the way it is not blown up. This is East Prussia, 1914. You're seeing a current contemporary map with all the details that the Germans had applied to their homeland in the northeast portion of their country. And we'll see that throughout this discussion. But I wanted to at least let you know that we utilize this map, my co-authors, Helmut and Carl, and I'll get more about them in, in this discussion. 
we utilized this map extensively and learned down to the square kilometer as to how maneuvers were accomplished in this battle. When you think about warfare in the 1913-14 timeframe, what comes to mind is the fortresses, Festung for German. Uh, the fortresses were in key areas throughout the region. And you see by the icons there, you have Königsberg near the top, you have Taunus to the east of there. These were in compliance with the known philosophies of warfare where you had festones or fortresses maintaining dominance over a particular geographical area. This is based on the 17th century French brilliant strategist Beaulieu, who basically planted the seed throughout Europe as to how warfare should be conducted. And up until this year, 1914, festones became the predominant way to defend. That concept was destroyed in the first weeks of the war particularly in the East Prussian area or Ost Prussian area. To give you a flavor of the contemporary Germany at this time, we have an aviation map generated in 1914 with the icons showing various airfields and, and air operations throughout Germany. In the Northeast portion, as you can see there, they had their own uh, stable of airplanes and Zeppelins. The Germans also accounted for whether the Russians had aviation assets. Again, this is 1914, just before the war started. It gives you appreciation for the immensity of what the Germans had to, a correction, what the Russians had to establish in terms of maintaining an aerial presence throughout their country, which of course was so massive. So let's go to the key players into this scenario that we're gonna discuss. Germany had only one major army to defend Ost Prussia, which is German for East Prussia. Armee, I'll call it Eighth Armee. This particular German army had four corps. We'll see the key players. It was commanded by General Oberst von Pritwitz. He was basically a inner circle with the Kaiser. Obviously, he acquired the command. Uh, the fact that he was a General Oberst, which meant he was a four-star, four that meant for obviously he had the right connections. He wasn't incompetent, but he was somewhat hesitant, you'll see. His chief of staff was General Mayor Valdese, who obviously was the man who did most of the communications with the overall headquarters at Koblenz. We're gonna go right into the air piece because this gives you an appreciation for the structure associated with the armies. In this case, Fliegertruppe was the name of the German air force, flying troops. So when Fliegertruppe operated, that meant they were the ones in the airplanes, they were the ones planning the sorties, and they were the one flying the mission. This is an interesting slide because it shows you a year prior to the war, Records are being set and a sad statement about the fact that here you have a record being set between the two adversaries, two hostile nations. A gentleman by the name of Viktor Stroefler flew from Germany to Warsaw, then was part of the Russian province. And that particular sortie was the longest sortie by a single engine airplane, 1,550 kilometers, an eight hour flight. If you think about it, aviation had really matured in less than a decade to this particular accomplishment. And that's what we're seeing as we discuss the first few weeks of the war. Now, the person you're looking at here is Thompson. He was the lead aviator for planning on the General Stab. His career, basically, uh, he was not much uh, of a record setting pilot, but he was brilliant in the way he organized Fliegertruppe for the German senior ranks, and he eventually crossed the board for both Western and Eastern Front. When we look at the various aeroplanes, what you're going to see in the next minute or so is a nice suite of well-designed, of the time, German aeroplanes. These are biplanes for the most part. They are the B-class, 
which meant that the A class, which we'll talk about shortly, was the first of the fielded airplanes. And then the B class becomes more in place and they basically carry on for the years that follow. In this case, you're looking at LVG, which is Luftverkehrsgesellschaft, a Berlin firm that flew this particular, uh, I mean, built this particular airplane. What's significant about this particular variant is that it was flown by the aviators directly subordinate to the 8th Army headquarters. Now you're looking at an airplane that a lot of folks recognize when you think about the beginning of World War I, the Taube. That's German for dove. This case is a Rumpler Taube, a Rumpler Taube subordinate to the 1st Army Corps, which we're going to learn about in the next few minutes, was a very significant German Corps that fought most of the Battle of Pannenberg and such. Then you have an albatross. This is subordinate to the 17th Army Corps, which was a familiar face on the Eastern Front, a gentleman by the name of Mackison. We'll talk about him as well, give you an appreciation for what 17th Army Corps did throughout this entire campaign. Then you have a variant of the Taube, a Janine Stau Taube, which was very subordinate to General Schultz's 20th Army Corps. That was the primary corps that defended the south of East Prussia against the in German oppression against the Russian Second Army. Then you have a different configuration. You have a Taube. In this case, it's owned and operated by the Fortress Königsberg, Festung Königsberg. This simple design flew very, very important sorties as we'll see in the discussion where they basically single-handedly monitored most of the Russian first army while the rest of the German corps flew south, a Christian headed south to destroy the second army. So I give them credit for their mission accomplishments over the few weeks that started the war. Everybody understands what a Zeppelin looks like. And this one's unique because this is Zeppelin IV. Oh, by the way, in April of 1913, uh, it left, got off course and landed in France. So the French had a firsthand view of Zeppelin technology. They were able to do some reverse engineering to see how Zeppelin was built and configured. And then they eventually released it back to the Germans. Well, Z4 basically maintained the Zeppelin operations in the Eastern Front for, for the beginning of the war to the mid-1915. We'll discuss its counterpart, Z5, as well. Going back to the Russian side, what you have is their Northwest Front. That's their operation that are basically configured into two fronts. The question is, where is Northwest Front? Well, basically, it was focused off of East Prussia. Southwest Front was the primary Russian front on the Eastern Front, and that was against the Austro-Hungarian Galatian region. And we'll talk about in brief. So who's in charge on the Russian side? Well, you have the uncle of Nicholas II, Grand Duke Nikolai. He obviously is the man who's kind of running the war in the opening months of the war and has a lot of challenges. He's having to deal with arcane thinking with several of the generals. And you're looking at one of the chief uh, villains of the Russian leadership. And I call him a villain right up front because Zelensky, if there's a fall guy for the failures of the Eastern Front, he, he's front and center. But he was a general of cavalry. Note that I have that spelled out. When you see general of cavalry, that meant he had an understanding of what it took to maneuver over vast areas, which in turn meant that Zerlinski had an insight onto how reconnaissance was conducted because most of your long range reconnaissance of the time was done by cavalry. So we'll have that editorial comment throughout this briefing. Then you have the two army commanders going into post Prussia. Note, General of Cavalry, von Rennenkampf. He was the commander of the Russian First Army, which was to the north. And his counterpart coming from the south into Ostprussia was General Okavri Samsonov. 
emphasis again on the fact that here's three Russian commanders who understood what long range reconnaissance was about, and what the cavalry's capabilities were. But the sad story of Tannenberg is they didn't live up to that responsibility by executing what they should have known. Now, I can't speak Russian. I'm not going to take any credit for the, the sacrifice of the correct Russian terminology. But what you have here is the RIBBF. This is equivalent to Fliegertruppe. This is equivalent to the Air Service, be it RAF, or to the Avalanche Mil Militaire of the French. So what you see in RIBBF, definitely in our book, that's the term that we use to describe the aviators assigned to the Russian fleet. Prior to this, Carl, my counterpart, and I had worked with IRAF, Imperial Russian Air Force, but that was not the correct term, although it's easier to remember. But for my way of living now, I have to think in terms of RIBBF. So who you have in charge, it's really more of a, a leadership position where they provide advice to the commands. In this case, Stavka was the overall command. That's where Nikolai operated. And you have the Grand Duke Mikhailovich, who was a cousin of the Tsar. And notice that long-winded Russian title there, head of organization of aviation affairs for armies of the Southwest Front. Mikhailovich is the one who basically manages most of the Russian aviation for the war. Now, as it involves the Northwest Front, we have Baron Kalbars. And you notice in this farming, he's sitting in the back seat there. Kalbars was was energetic, he was dedicated, he flew as much as he could with his, his fellow Russian pilots. And obviously he had a more difficult assignment from the standpoint of he's dealing with army commanders that didn't really appreciate aviation as it should have been. So the airplanes that you see with the Russian fleet were primary French designs. The Newport 4 looked, as you see in here, a single wing uh, the seats were side by side for the pilot and co-pilot or observer. They, the squadrons, as we are called, these are core, KO stands for core aviation detachment. That means that's your equivalent to a squadron or an escadrille. And you see the assignment, the, uh, the nomenclature there for both first army, there was three KOs and for second army, there was two. Then you go to the Farman, which was the French design that most people have seen in the, in the uh, Western Front. And it's got a great observation setup for the crew because obviously you don't have an engine in the way, you can look over the side. And by the way, this shot's unique because you're looking at a French aviator who flew for the Russians, Poyer. And he was very detailed in his sorties and his history is one of the few surviving accounts of what the Russians accomplished in aviation, definitely on the Northwestern Front. Notice that the airplanes assigned here, you have one KAO with the Farman and the Russian Second Army had three KAOs. So we have an airplane that needs to be brought into everybody's awareness. And this is the technological leap associated with aviation prior to the war. One man, Igor Sikorsky, designed and built and flew the first four engine airplane in history. This is the Lagrand. The gentleman in the forward area of the cockpit happens to be the Tsar. He's talking to Sikorsky. This is before the war. And it shows the fact that the Russians weren't behind the rest of the world in terms of their understanding of aviation. In fact, they took a great leap forward the sad thing is that they were not able to field the Igor, the Ilya Miramets in numbers to make a difference until 1915. And we'll have an understanding of that. I have to share this because when you do the search in the Library of Congress, the Omaha Bee had an article about the Igor, the Ilya Miramets says a new and terrible war machine. It was on page 17 along with the Bee's fashion. So that tells you that as it was concerns to the folks in the Midwest, Ilya Miramets really didn't have front page cloud at that time. 
So let's go into the war. The 1st of August basically is when the war started. By the 10th of August, you have the mobilization well underway and the first and the second armies are formed and are heading towards post Prussia. This is a contemporary map showing you in the red circles what the Russian positions were. Now, I apologize for the details, but what you have is what we have. And these are contemporaries. So we want you to see how the last 100 years was understood with cartography. So in this case, the map has red circles signifying the Russian. To the east, you have the various units of Brennan Camp's First Army. Then you can see some maneuvers in the south, lead elements of the Second Army. Note where Königsberg is up into the upper left-hand corner. Now, if I use this cursor, can folks see the cursor? If I swing around here, is that making a difference? If so, I'll start using the cursor. But Königsberg is the key target for First Army in the opening weeks of the war. So on 17 August, Russia actually invades Germany. And what you have on that date is not only they cross the border, but they have the first major battle between the Russians and the Germans at Steliabrunen, which is a large town about 20 miles from the border. And that's where you find the Germans rush to colors to make sure that their homeland is to be defended at all costs. And this is a gentleman that we're going to talk about throughout this discussion because this is get around the infantry, von Francois. He's a very unique guy. He's a Prussian general. And in my understanding of history, if you were insubordinate in the Prussian army, you didn't last very long. Well, this guy lasted throughout. In fact, he got promoted. And we'll see in the discussions about how his insubordination led to maneuvers that basically helped win the battle. So at Stalyapunin, you have the Esprit, like you see in the opening days on the Western Front, all the soldiers rushing forward to attack the enemy, destroy them. The sad story is that like on the French army with their Esprit, they basically got slaughtered in those opening moments. Then you move forward after Stalyapunin and you find out that Zelensky is now harassing Samsonov to get his act together and get his army moving forward at a faster clip. But understand that Samsonov had a greater challenge. He had to put together his, his forces. He also had to go over longer distances. And oh, by the way, the ter terrain wasn't as advanced. You didn't have the rail networks in that particular area like they had up in the northern part where Zelensky, uh, Zelensky's plan basically favored First Army. But you can see from the discussion here, he's talking about Stalapinen and he's saying, hey, we've got to get into the fight, speed it up. So what you have on the 20th of August is one of the most significant battles of the First World War. Why? Because the Russian army and the German army, Eighth Army, now meet at Gabinian, which is about 10 miles west of Stalapunin. Here's the map showing basically that area. You can see some movements in the southwest where the Russians are starting to mouth ready to leave, uh, enter into East Prussia. If you look to the north there, you see the Russian armies are now fully within the East Prussian area. And <clears throat> now you have the Stalapunin battle. A closer look, what you see there, the blue, in this case, is somewhat confusing because you have different maps. This is a map that was acquired from the Francois book. It gives you an understanding of what he saw was significant. The red represents the Russians in this case, and the Ger Germans are blue. Francois's force, which was First Army Corps, basically took the initiative. Prinfitz wanted to be somewhat conservative. He didn't want to have all the forces reach, reach out and fight right away. He wanted to basically build up his strength and then meet the Russian threat in a much more advantageous fashion. But 
unfortunately for him, he had Francois on his staff and Francois basically maneuvered well ahead of the rest of the forces, which caused the other corps that were supposed to be brought up within the days to have to march overnight straight 36 kilometers in the case of 17th Army Corps uh, commanded by Mackinson and also 1st Reserve Corps commanded by Von Bielow. If you look in the lower end there, you can see the long range that those two corps had to move east to be able to be part of the battle. So what you have is the Russians had the advantage. And so they were able to partially defeat the Germans at Gumbinian, which obviously caused concerns for the 8th Army Command because they didn't know how much they could hold the Russian army at bay, especially when they knew that the second army was coming north as we spoke. So Francois, being him, he's basically leading the charge because he's from this part of the, of the German country and he wants to make sure that they defend every square inch. Mackinson, in charge of 17th Army Corps, has a depth, he's a cavalry officer. He understands how reconnaissance is employed and he shows that throughout the war. Oh, by the way, he ended up being a general Feldmarschall and fights the war, to almost uh, commands the German forces in Romania for the last year. Von Bielow also is very seasoned uh, combatant understands what has to be done. His command of the 1st Reserve Corps is stellar. They are very tight the way they operate and maneuver. Now, this is a map that's kind of hard to see, but if you were able to study it, what happens is on the 21st of August, 1914, you have command by Pritvitz saying, we're gonna to have to retreat. We're gonna to have to go behind the Vistula River, which is, in this area right here, if you can see the cursor moving up and down. So they're all right here at Gumbinian. So he's basically ordering his forces to start the retreat to the Vistula. Well, what you have is an astonished command staff on 8th Army to include one guy named Max Hoffman, who is a obes Leutnant He's the operations guy for the command staff, and he's the one who understands what some of the issues are in depth. And obviously his boss, Von Pritvitz, is not listening to him because Von Pritvitz is telling Molka back in Koblenz, we're gonna have to get out of here and move as far as west as we can to get safely in place at the Vistula. So what you have is maneuvers independently by the German army. You have, von, uh, you have Francois's first army corps now being moved by rail from the northern portion of Gumbinian to the southern area of Ostprussen. No, I said by rail. They were able to move that, move that entire corps in a matter of days to get that in place. 17th Army Corps, which was Mackinson, and 1st Reserve Corps, which is Bielof, are now slowly moving back towards the Vistula. What you have here is American press, and it shows you what the understanding by the world of what was happening on the 25th of August, four, five days after the actual battle, the Russians are claiming massive battle, and they claim a brilliant success. But I wanted to also show that they also have a subtitle where Lord Kitchener makes a statement that this war is gonna go on. And you have folks thinking, hey, this is gonna be over by Christmas. But Kitchener obviously led the British military at this time and his understanding of how he saw the reality. But I thought that was a nice little compliment to what we're seeing here. And note, this is our front range page news of the Honolulu Star Bulletin. Those folks in Hawaii need to know what's going on. As it involves the ongoing legacy of Gumbinian, where it's so significant, is because Ron Pritfitz 
is nervous, very nervous about what the Russian potential is with two armies invading and making success like they did in the invasion battle. He basically tells Kobolens in Molka's headquarters, I need more forces. So they move out of the campaign going through Belgium at this time, one army corps. They put them on a train and they have that entire corps heading east. I think it's the 11th Army Corps. And those folks arrive in a few days, a few weeks after Gumbinian. But that gives you an impression of the fact is the full strength of the planned offensive on the Western Front doesn't take place because the Eastern Front is saying, I need more forces to defend Germany. So that's one of the discussions that can be ongoing for time memorial on how we see Gumbinian as involved one of the most important moments of the war. And ironically, it's in the first two and a half weeks of the war. So the folks in Koblenz are aghast. Here it is, you have von Pripyat's order and retreat. You have German soil being conquered by the Russian first army. Second army is coming into German soil from the south. <clears throat> A decision is made, fire Fritz. So on the 23rd of August, 1914, a new guy arrives on the scene, von Hindenburg. Von Hindenburg had his own amazing career up to that time, but he obviously was looked upon as kind of like, you know, he had served his country, thank you very much. He came as a three-star, a around the infantry, and then in the opening weeks of his campaign on the, on the Eastern Front, he becomes a four-star. Eventually, he becomes a field marshal by the end of, of 1914. But his first comments to the Eighth Army that he now commands is, let us have trust in each other and do our duty. And his chief of staff is somebody who's in history is one of the most important German commanders of the 20th century, Eric Ludendorff. Not von Ludendorff. He wanted von because obviously has an honorific title, but he never got that. So it's Eric Ludendorff. And he came from his success in Belgium at Liège. He was a Oberst colonel at that time. He becomes a General von Mayor, Christian General Mayor. Editorial comment here. All of the American and British historians over the last century have never taken the time to correctly label a German general. So they have always translated Gerhard Mayor, which means major general, but they don't show that rank in commensurate what it is on the American side, which is a brigadier general, a one star. So Ludendorff is a one star general, chief of staff, newly promoted, part of Hindenburg's headquarters. General Leutnant is a in the German army, it's a two-star. When you have it as a gen lieutenant general in the American forces, that's three-star. So you understand my concern when we look at history, we haven't given the level of responsibility correctly to the understanding of who these soldiers are or commanders are, because a one-star has less authority than a two-star and so on, so on, so on. So Hindenburg, sets the scene. He's, he's obviously a very experienced campaigner. He understands what it takes to command an army and he trusts his soldiers and he's not gonna retreat. And so you have, here's Hindenburg with his what, 20th Corps command, uh, 20th Army Corps commander, General der Artillery von Schulz. And the guy on the right is Oberst Lieutenant Hoffmann. He's the Intel operator guy on the Eighth Army staff. And Hoffman has a very successful career on the Eastern Front. And we'll talk about him more as this discussion goes on. All right, now, as an Intel guy, we have various disciplines in Intel. You have aerial reconnaissance for photographic interpretation or imagery interpretation today. You have wireless intercepts back in this time, radio intercepts, just signals and intelligence. That's another field altogether. Wireless intercepts were well in place in 1914. If you look at the Western Front, 
the most famous intercept collection site on the European continent was the Eiffel Tower. What does that tell you? That there was well in place, people were understanding what radio transmissions were about, and they knew how to collect that information. What you have with wireless intercepts, and this is our discussion for you in this presentation, is you have the ability to collect against the enemy as it is a random collection. You don't have the ability to task to get the exact information you need at a certain time and place as a radio intercept, wireless intercept kind of collections operation. On the other hand, aviation, and this is the premises of our, of our work for the four volumes, aviation is a dedicated intelligence collection resource. And so when you see the discussion evolve here, you're gonna see tasking of airplanes that makes a difference in terms of the commander's understanding of how information is to be collected, processed, analyzed, and disseminated. So air reconnaissance takes priority and it definitely is that way on the Western Front, especially when trench warfare takes place. So on the first person area, you have a well-configured architecture for wireless intercepts. You have these large main radio stations at each of the fortress locations. Notice Königsberg is at the top. That's the one that got some of the most important collection in the first few months of the war on the Eastern Front. The Eighth Army had their own wireless intercept teams called heavy radio stations. They deployed them as they saw fit to support the headquarters. AOK, by the way, stands for Abe Oba Commando, which is the headquarters staff for the most part, or the headquarters command for, in this case, Eighth Army. Note the last line, three deployed to 1st Cavalry Division. We're gonna talk about that in detail in a few minutes. So here's a mobile radio station. How the collection is, I can't tell you. All I know is that these guys are in the field and they're obviously able to maneuver with the forces. You're looking at one of the most important intelligence figures of the 20th century. He's an Austrian, Hauptmann Pocconi. He's the guy who led the Central Powers understanding of the Russian encryption he could break the code in a matter of days. He's the one who basically led the Southwestern Front's defense against the Russians by finding out what the Russian commands were doing well ahead of the commands themselves and was able to get that information to the German and Austro-Hungarian forces. His stature was so great that at Brest-Litovsk in 1917, he led the table at, uh, for the Austro-Hungarians, an Austrian of the first order. So what you have here is text that talks about two major intercepts that occurred the morning of the 26th of August, 1914. Here's First Army, Renenkamp. He transmits a very important message to his subordinate Fourth Corps commander telling him what he wants him to do. Well, this was an open-ended transmission. It was not encrypted. It was collected by Königsberg. The information was sent to 8th Army headquarters, Hindenburg and Ludendorff, in a matter of minutes once they had it translated and such. And that basically opened up everybody's eyes that number one, you have the ability to get the Russians in a disadvantage because they're sharing in an open-ended open source manner, what their plans are. What's significant about fourth Corps transmission is that it is telling that commander, you're gonna still continue to march towards Königsberg. We're not gonna divert you south to help Samsonov's army as it advances. So that was critical as involved the continuing planning for Hindenburg and Ludendorff on how this whole campaign was unfolding. At the same time, Samsonov transmits to his commander, Kaliev, 13th Corps, not to go straight north. He wants them to go northwest. Why? Because the Russians are still under the impression on this 24th of August that the Germans are still retreating to the Vistula. And that blindness 
is what destroys the army in the campaign that we're now seeing. So the Battle of Tannenberg commences on the 26th of August. What happens on that day, as you can see from the West Point map, much more clearly laid out here, you have in the upper right-hand corner here, you have Renenkamp's First Army, you have his four corps, and they're all moving due east, correction, due west to Königsberg. You have the Germans have basically maneuvered their forces. In this case, here is Mackinson's 17th Army Corps. He's moving due south. Here's von Bielow's First Reserve Corps. He's moving southwest and then he's going south. So they're in parallel. They're about ready to hit the Russian Sixth Corps under guy's name is Blagovshensky. And if you want another villain for the Russians, that guy takes a hook, line and sinker because he didn't trust his aviators. He didn't have a good reconnaissance. And here you have two German corps going south to fight him. And he has no clue that they're even in his front yard. So you also have down in the south here, you have first army corps under Francois setting up. You had 20th corps under Schultz, basically correction, right here, holding fire as second army rolled into East Prussia. Now you see on this map that the German maneuver is taking place. What's amazing is because the Russian commands did not have the reconnaissance in place. They had a cavalry brigade, but they were not being pushed to the max. They were being held up for whatever reason. The commander just did not see the emphasis and need to be able to, convert, uh, to scout out the region ahead towards Königsberg. So as a result, the reconnaissance for all intents and purposes was a failure. Meanwhile, you see these little red dots here. That's your first cavalry division. So you have basically one division holding off four army corps of Russians. It's an amazing story. So here's Renekamp and he's basically saying to Zelensky as he's plodding along in the Northern First Army Front, we don't have any information on where the Germans are. That in itself, it tells you the story of Tannenberg because they did not command their forces in relationship to where the enemy was. And then you have Eighth Army Command sweating it out because they just made a major maneuver of all their forces to head south to destroy Second Army. And as Ludendorff says in his memoir, they hung over like a threatening thundercloud. So understand, no one got to sleep that night in 8th Army headquarters because they were worried to death that 1st Army would pick up and start moving fast. And this was 1st Army's objective. Here is Fortress Königsberg, which, by the way, is now called Kaliningrad. And the Russians gave up everything but Kaliningrad because they wanted a better port facility for their Navy in the Baltic. And they still own it to this day. But Königsberg was the major city in was prison of its time. So yeah, we get around Lieutenant Brecht, and he's a commander of 1st Cavalry Division. And here is his responsibility is to have his mobile forces to basically scout out, harass, conduct guerrilla warfare against four Russian corps that are slowly moving west towards Königsberg. And guess what they utilize? Bicycle Corps, Rod Fire Company, bicycle companies. Here are these guys who are subordinate to the 1st Cavalry Division. They ride a very impressive steed of Fiji, Fujis and uh, Felts and other bikes of his time has been being, being facetious. What you have with this particular mobile bicycle company is the ability to traverse the roads of East Prussia because they know the neighborhood, that was where their homes were, and go the bike paths in the back and do the same thing as the cavalry. One quick vignette. On the 10th of August, seven days before the Russians invaded Germany, 
one of these cyclists rode into Russia, 10 miles into Russia, ambushed a Russian staff car. Three Russian officers were in the car, killed all three of them, examined what they had in the car, got the latest plans of what the Russians' intentions were, put it in his knapsack and rode back into Germany and basically told the German commanders what to expect because they saw that from the plans, the Russians were not that aggressive as involved ground to be gained, but it took a guy on a bike to find that information. In the intelligence world, his information, which was the actual plans of the commanders in writing is called perfect intelligence. Aviation was also integral to the planning, conducting the whole of the first army at bay. So you have a simple Tauba dove flying sorties on a regular basis. They received the highest praise from the German command for their ability to reconnoiter the area, to find out where the Russian soldiers were camped or where they were maneuvering. That associated with the wireless, associated with the bicycle companies and so on and so on. Oh, by the way, the German populace was also supporting the intelligence collection by ringing church bells or sending messages out via the remaining telephone lines or whatever. So it was a full force of intelligence collection against the first army. And here's your wireless center, mobile, up and down the Western area of East Prussia, supporting the maneuvers of the Bicycle Corps and the cavalry. So let's go back to where the battle is. So on the 26th of August with Tannenberg starting, you see from, ben, uh, from Francois's maps where the first major battle occurs in this Uzdau in the Southern portion of East Prussia. You have the first corps of Russians trying to go west against the well-in-placed First Army Corps of Francois. It's a long day, it's a 24-hour battle from the 26th to the 27th. What saves the day for the Germans is the fact that they utilize their artillery more effectively than the Russians did. Here's a very famous painting of the time. You have Ludendorff talking to Hindenburg. Here's Hoffman at the Periscope, senior staff. Note the staff is head buried into maps. Why? Because maps control the battle. What you have from that one map I showed you of the Ostprussian is as detailed as a map as anybody had at that time. No clue if the Russians had the same map, but obviously they didn't know the area as well as the Germans did. So the Germans were able to reconnoiter down to the square meter as to where the Russians were. And this painting kind of gives you that flavor. So on the 27th of August, the success at Uzdau takes place. Francois's Corps goes into Uzdau at 11 o'clock. They commence cutting off the Russian retreat at Niedenburg, Willenburg. Why is this significant? Because it's the heads up that now the Germans have an understanding of how they can defeat the Russian second army by cutting off their retreat south. And by capturing Uzdau, they cut off one of the main lines of communication. The second army starts to lose control. Why? Because here's another Francois map. Here you have the 17th Army Corps of Mackinson. He's gone south. He just fought a battle against the Sixth Corps of the Russians at Bischofsburg, defeated them. That Sixth Corps is now heading south and 17th Corps is chasing them. Significance about that is on the Eastern portion of East Prussia, the commanders did not take reconnaissance seriously. The Sixth Corps commander didn't trust his aviators. If he had had good aerial reconnaissance, he would have found both 17th Corps and 1st Reserve Corps heading south towards him in 10 mile long columns of forces. 
two separate highways, 10 miles of soldiers heading south. But he didn't use his reconnaissance. So as a result, you see six Corps is worthless. And the only thing they can do well is retreat. And they're lucky to get back into Russia because they, they got saved. Meanwhile, you have the Russian 13th Corps being defeated at Allenstein, and you have the Russian 15th Corps being defeated at Hohenstein, and then you have the 23rd Corps also taking licks from the German forces in the south there. What you see from this array is that there's the evolving story of Tannenberg, where the two Russian Corps, 13th and 15th, are now being defeated, they're heading south, trying to become able to reconfigure and fight back against the advancing German forces. But you have first Corps, first reserve Corps heading south. You have 17 Corps chasing six Corps, but that maneuver basically is the Germans own this ground and the Russians are now basically in disarray. So the afternoon of the 28th, you have a better understanding through the colors here. Blue is German, red is Russian. <clears throat> Here's 17th Corps in the Northwest. Here's the retreating 6th Corps, correction, 17th Army Corps for the Southwest, South, correction, uh, the Southeast of those Prussian. You have the 6th Corps. You see the Belov's forces taking on the 13th Corps defeating them outside of Allenstein. <clears throat> a major battle takes place at Hohenstein, where you have the Germans well defended with artillery support, basically defeating the 15th Corps. And then another battle where the, first divi the 41st Division is first retreated and it's able to reinforce and come back. And you start to see this, the Russian forces are starting to retreat. And you find here's AOK, -okay, that's the German significance for a command. Here's Samsonov's headquarters right here. Note where Francois is. Here's his first army corps to the very south. He's just defeated Samsonov's first corps and they're now retreating back into Russia. So now you have Francois moving east. What's gonna happen in the hours to come? Francois is going to develop a picket line of Germans that is basically going to give the impression to the Russians that they can't go any further because there's more Germans defending the southern area where they didn't work before. While this battle is going on, Zeppelin V was doing a sortie over the northern Russian province area, and it came too low and it was shot down by artillery. <clears throat> The magazine says that Cossacks firing rifles was able to bring it down. It's a great magazine piece, but no, it was artillery that brought that Zeppelin down. So the Germans had one artillery remaining, that was Z4. <clears throat> so I've talked about Francois. Here he is, he's maneuvering his first army corps to the very south and extending them to a picket line. What you have now is 13th Corps and 15th Corps surrendered because they've been encircled by the Germans. So Martos, 15th Corps, here he is talking to Francois. Hey, we screwed up. And then you have Kluyev of 13th Corps seeing Francois before he's headed off to the interrogation center. Seems like Francois was everywhere in this battle. Well, okay. He, he does his thing, we'll talk about that briefly as how he ends up in this war. Classic quote by the defeated General of Infantry Martos of 15th Corps. I approached the Niedenberg battlefield blindfolded. That says it all in terms of understanding what happens in the Battle of Tannenberg. Your Russian commanders didn't know where in the hell the enemy was throughout the campaign. They had resources, they had aviation, they had wireless. The Germans screwed up in their, some of their wireless transmissions, but it wasn't as egregious as what the Russians did. But what you see from the way Tannenberg is accomplished for 
the maneuvers of the Germans, the Germans took tremendous risk and they paid off. So what you have right now on the 29th of August, headlines, baseball results, <clears throat> Germans win at Allenstein. It's kind of like the Red Sox defeating the Yankees at Yankee Stadium. And you saw, you see from that particular headline, another focus is, oh, by the way, you have the Battle of the Marne about ready to take place. It's about ready to take place. You have the German corps heading south of Mons, the Royal uh, Forces, the Royal Army Forces, no, not Royal, the British Army is heading south towards Paris. <clears throat> the French maneuvers are trying to consolidate and defend Paris against the advancing hordes, and you have your taxi armies and so on and so on. What comes out of this particular discussion is that all things we understand about World War I is based on what the Marne was. Ironically, when you do the deep dive research on what happens on the Eastern Front, it took precedence chronologically over what happened on the Western Front. And then you see the papers, in this case, the leading journalistic standard in Ogden, Utah, saying that Germans and Russians both claim victories. <clears throat> and they, Germans obviously saying, hey, we just beat two army corps. And the Russians are saying, hey, we, all, we invested in Königsberg. I don't know what invested means for the most part, but what it says to you that they're telling the world, hey, we accomplished our objective on taking Königsberg, which did not happen. They were still kind of marching slowly. They got close about 25 kilometers to Königsberg before they realized they couldn't make a difference. So what you have now is you have two corps that have fully capitulated, 13th and 15th Corps, captured by the encirclement by 8th Army forces. You have the 6th Corps of the Russians retreating towards Russia. And then you have Francois' forces south on near the uh, Prussian southern border. So here's a map shows you basically that, what I just said. Notice the blue circle around, which is surrounded by red. There's your envelopment, it's successful. Here's your picket line that I mentioned before. That's all of Francois' forces. And then you see the lame attempt by Renenkamp to help out first uh, his Samsonov second army by starting to divert his forces to the Southwest. Too late, they're no longer moving on Königsberg. They're trying to see what they can do to save the second army. In the middle of the night between the 29th and the 30th, of August, General Samsonov is basically surrounded by Germans, goes into the woods and shoots himself. This grave was set up by the Germans to, to at least let them, let everybody know that they appreciated Samsonov as a enemy commander. And obviously it makes it clear that they, they respected him. His widow tried to find his body. They were able to share the fact that they had it buried at this location. So the point from all this is that it's a, it's a sad ending to somebody who tried, but he didn't have all the cards dealt his way. Again, here we go back to Van Francois. What you see from our discussion now is that his forces are headquartered at Niedenberg. We go back to here. Niedenberg is right down here. Right, here it is, I'm, I, the cursor is surrounding Niedenberg. So notice the picket line is right there. The highway leading up into Niedenburg is where a new drama is unfolding because Francois is unaware that there's a Russian re uh, relief element about half a corps marching on the road and going towards Niedenburg to basically destroy First Army Corps. So Francois has his sorties generated flying the the Rumpler Taub, going over this region in detail to make sure that, okay, confirm that we're not at risk of anything. And he honors his pilots. He trusts their judgments. He understands what it takes to, to maneuver an airplane and get information in a timely manner. So two sorties are flown. The first one picks up the fact that there is a Russian Corps or a Porsche Corps heading up the highway and they drop a message on the town square of Niedenburg where had Francois had set up his headquarters. 
So he gets the alert, hey, guess what? I'm at risk right now. He gets all his staff, get in their motor cars and go out to everybody and get them into positions of safety so that we can now defend ourselves against the advancing Russian forces. A second sortie occurs. This one has more fame to it because they fly the, the area as you see there in blue. They land at Niedenberg in a potato field and then they're able to bicycle into Niedenberg and give Francois the information of what exactly is threatening him in from the south. They in turn were able to get either another airplane or whatever and fly up to the headquarters for 8th Army where Hindenburg and Ludendorff were and make them aware that, hey, we're still got a problem. The Russians are still advancing to try to save the day. So air power was employed, basically critical messages at the right time to make sure that the German commanders knew they still were at risk. All right, so when we see what's happening at this time on the Western Front, Joffre is fighting at the Marne, he's maneuvering his forces, and he finds out, not from communication on the diplomatic side, but from a intercept of a German transmission that says that three Russian corps and the two Russian corps commanders were captured. They say 70,000. Other follow-up historical analysis says about 100,000 Russian prisoners from the Tannenberg battle. And in a very profound way, the Russian Second Army no longer exists. So you're now fighting on both fronts. You're getting this in your face news that your Russian ally just had a major failure. And oh, by the way, if it had been conducted successfully, the Russians could have defeated the Germans in East Prussia and moved towards Berlin, which was not that far off. But that chapter never occurred. So what do we have now? Tannenberg is a success for the Germans. It just rewrites the whole book of World War I. And from the time that we're showing here between 31 August to 31 March, you have basically Hindenburg making the pronouncement in the Fliege kein Tannenberg. Without my flyers, no Tannenberg. That's the subtitle of volume one. It makes the case to the reader that what you see with intelligence collection, that if you had not had the ability to organize your aviators and collect on a regular basis and a timely basis, you wouldn't have had the ability to make the important decisions that were made in the course of that campaign of Tannenberg. wrong button. As it involves the legacy, what you have, the Russians basically did the right thing for the Allies on several fronts. First of all, Nikolai shown in this cartoon at the time, he basically allows the Russians to threaten the Germans. They in turn pull back a core and other forces, needed forces, for the successful conduct of the Western Front campaign. He's also conducting a major, major operation in the Southwestern Front against the Austro-Hungarians in Galatia. We're not talking two armies. I think we're talking five Russian armies that are just massive. The largest battlefield bloodletting of the entire war is now occurring in the Southwestern Front over Galatia. So the Russians did their job in helping out the French by, oh, by taking on the Germans in East Prussia, but at the same time, they also conducted their major offensives against the Austrians and the Austro-Hungarians. Why is this significant? Because the Russians really felt that their enemy was the Austro-Hungarians. They put up a token force in many ways against the Germans. The Germans obviously were able to filter out forces to the south and then they conduct their campaign in the weeks that follows with the formation of the Ninth Army, which Hindenburg and Ludendorff now command. They leave the Eighth Army in place to basically mop up against the Russians that are retreating. And that's part of the Masurian Lakes campaign. I won't go into that detail here. And then, oh, by the way, you have a new commander for Eighth Corps, Eighth Army. But what's intriguing is our good buddy Francois, who has this insubordinate nature about, hey, I'm going to fight the battle the way I want to fight it. He basically 
short shrifts the Eighth Army commander and basically tells the folks back in Koblenz in the Kaiser's court, I can do the job. Well, they believe him. So they fire that Eighth Army commander and Francois is now the Eighth Army commander. What happens to Francois? He screws up. They basically make him a corps commander. So in other words, he loses all of his stature and they send him to the Western Front. Well, he comes back in the months that follow and it becomes the 41st Corps commander, Army Corps commander, and is part of that campaign that takes place as they enter into Russia. This gives you a flavor for what happens as First Army is now retreating back to Russia. And you can see from the graphic here, these are the various aviation units flying reconnaissance, getting a picture of where is the retreating First Army. You can see that some of them have a lot of extensive sortie distance heading to the southeast. But the point from this discussion is Renenkamp is in retreat and he keeps on retreating and they have major battles in the weeks to come. And it's a very blood, another bloodbath. <clears throat> this is basically the last of the major battles that involves those Prussian. You have another German army now, the 10th army under General August Eichhorn. Von Bieloff is no longer charge of the 1st Reserve Corps. He's now the 8th Army commander in this time where they're basically defeating the Russians and moving them east towards the Vilna area and Lida area. Notice that you have in the south a new German army, the 9th Army under General Mackensen. And in the months to come in 1915, you have one of the most successful operational campaigns of the entire war, Gorlici Tarnov where Mackinson employing the best aerial reconnaissance possible, employing artillery as effective as can be employed in that war, basically conducts a massive operation and defeats the Russian forces. And basically they have a 60 mile advance on the Gorlicha Tarnoff front. Wrong button, okay. As for aviation, Russian tactical aviation was a failure because in the case of those person, they didn't use it effectively. They continued to upgrade and improve the Ilya Miramets. They finally get permission to build a fleet of them. They have their own challenges with this particular airplane. But what's important is come the February, March, of April of 1915, the Ilya Miramets now demonstrates its potential as a strategic reconnaissance platform. You see this long range airplane covering massive territory. Oh, by the way, you can have a crew on board that are intelligence specialists, artillery specialists to do real time analysis as they're flying over the terrain. At the same time, you can drop bombs. And this is where the commanders now understand the potential of an alien miramids because they can conduct long range sorties with this amazing airplane and they can cover vast territories. And what we cover in the discussion in volume one is the fact is they basically have reconnaissance over the entire East Prussian area, Ost Prussian in one sortie. Because they also carried cameras on board, the, the Ulyanen plate camera and the Pota film camera. So they're able to get aerial photography and bring it back and show the commanders, in this case, Russian First Army, what exactly is the actual layout of German forces in the rear echelons area. So it's a major statement about Russian aviation coming to its own, but sadly for them, they come a little bit too late. They were not able to make a difference in their first battles. So with the commemorations of the post-war era, what's significant about that, one, Tannenberg is inscribed forever. Tannenberg was a, a location west of Allenstein where the major maneuvers were, but it's Ludendorff that basically coins the name the Battle of Tannenberg because he has the German knights who fought against the uh, Lithuanian, or whatever the, uh, the Poles and Lithuanian forces of that time, a couple hundred years prior. He wants Tannenberg to be enshrined in the minds of everybody. Then at the same time, in 1933, well, let me go back one. Notice you have 
Hindenburg leading the troops. You have Mackensen with his famous Death's, Death's Head Hussars hat. And he is a failed marshal as well. And then you have Ludendorff, who obviously doesn't have the stature of a Mackensen. But this is 1927 where this photograph was taken. <clears throat> For 1933, different world. You have Hindenburg as the Reich's president. And oh, by the way, you recognize this guy? Yeah, old what's his face. And unfortunately, here is a memorial to the Tannenberg battle that was built in the years following 27. And notice all the Nazi flags. So it's a new frontier in terms of a new enemy evolving. What comes out of this is a discussion that folks all understand from the standpoint of the last 50 years, not very much has been written about this battle. I mean, we have focused as historians for the most part on the Western Front, but I leave you with Solzhenitsyn because here's a guy who wrote some incredible work over this, his time in life, particularly in the 70s and 80s. August 1914 came out in 1970. I bought the book at that year and never read it until last week because I couldn't understand the German Russian names. And having lived with the Russian campaigns over the last eight years, I get to know those guys pretty well. But now picking up the books, so August 1914, I can go head to head with anybody on who's doing what, when, and where. In fact, we conclude the discussion in the conclusion with Solzhenitsyn because for what it's worth, he was in the Russian army. He was a counter battery officer, basically engaged in the artillery of the German forces. And his campaign was fought in East Prussia. So he walked the battleground of Tannenberg 20 years later. So with that, here's the three amigos, Carl Bavro, emeritus from the National Air and Space Museum, Helmut Jaeger, he was a NATO pilot, flew recce back in the 60s and 70s. Amazing man. And yours truly. And we're in Germany a couple of years ago, looking at how we're going to write the four volumes. And like I said, the first volume is almost done. It's going to go to the publisher. I want everybody to know that a gal named Elaine Mincer and I have worked the copy editing. She looked at every word, read it aloud, made sure that English was properly applied. And so when you read this book, it's as good as it can get in terms of telling the history. I keep on hitting the wrong button. And there's my previous works, Shooting in Front and A Delicate Affair on the Western Front. And there's my email address if you want to get a hold of me. So with that, I don't know what time it is, but uh, I hope I haven't put everybody to sleep, but I'm here to answer any questions. Terry, thanks millions for a brilliant and an unbelievably clear explanation of this whole process. I can't thank you enough for what you've done. I have a question. It's just this. Yeah. Uh, the, the whole area that you're describing, that part of East Germany and that part near Russia and uh, uh, what do they call Ost Ostpreußland, is that a flat area or is it a hilly, mountainous yeah. or what? Uh, there's... Yeah, it's flat. You got the lakes region, the Missouri Lakes, to the eastern portion. Obviously, I don't know the terrain that well. Obviously, uh, there's hills, and there were hills around, like places like Uzdau, because that's where the Germans were able to basically set up their artillery. So there is some topographical change, but for the most part, it's flat. Okay. And uh, maneuvering was easily accomplished. The Carpathian Mountains figured. are to the south. I'm sorry. I was figured. I figured it was flat, the way you described yeah. it on those maps. All right. Yeah. I'm opening us up, please, for more questions if anybody has them. Stunned into silence. <laughs> uh, Terry, we have a question in the chat here that I'll uh, uh, put forward. Um, let me just go up a little bit. This is from Rich and Sue. They ask if you can elaborate on uh, did the Russians have enough trained and skilled radio intercept staff and how did their equipment compare with the German equipment? Well, I, I'm not an expert in radio intercept. 
what I saw is what you saw. Uh, the points made by the experts, and Andy Smoot is a guy we chatted with. He was out of NSA and really a, an amazing guy. His detailed synopsis of Gambinian is classic. And he made it clear, he said, both Russian and German radio intercepts worked in terms of their capabilities. The Germans screwed up less, but they did transmit in the clear or they, whatever problems they had. Understand too, if you look at the Battle of the Marne, one of the most classic intercepts was the Germans basically spilled the beans on where they were and it was picked up by the French radio intercept technicians. And that gave them an understanding of where the German maneuvers were underway. So yes, the Germans had their problems. Definitely they had it on the Western front. They didn't screw up that bad on the Eastern front. Hope that answers it. Thanks, Terry. Right. Uh, we have another, oops, sorry, go ahead. Chandra, uh, is that Chandra? Yeah, it is. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, th thank you very much for your great talk. I've, um, I've read that, I can't remember where I read it, but I've read that, uh, the Russians really had a problem with their higher command staff and that Ren and Kampf, there was a lot of, I've read that there was a lot of bad blood between Ren and Kampf and Samsonov and that militated against their, their effective cooperation. Uh, have you read that or can you comment on that yeah. at all? Yeah, I, I have, General, but that's just it. I mean, they knew each other over the decades because they were part of, you know, the, the, evolving Russian command, and they were at the Russo-Japanese War in 1905, <clears throat> and they're both cavalry officers. So look at it this way. They weren't buddies. They, quote, respected each other, but they obviously had not a close association. And understand, too, that Zelensky was a cavalry officer, too, and he's the one who stirs the pot. He's the one, as a Northwest Front commander, that basically puts the two against each other. So if there's okay. a real villain for this entire campaign, it goes to Zelensky. What happened to Zelensky after this? Uh, he hung on until April of 15. They finally fired a sorry ass and they put in uh, <laughs> the guy from the Southwestern Front who did a much better job in terms okay. of managing. Thanks. Yeah. Speak up. Another question in the chat. Uh, Terry, do you mind if uh, I close the screen share so we can see everybody all at once? Yeah, please do. Yeah, yeah. You don't, yep. you don't see my mug anymore. <laughs> uh, yeah, and every I did also include the um, link to Terry's website with more info about the book. So you have the info. I'm going to close the screen sharing now, but you do have the information about his work in the um, in the chat. So let me just close that. Great. Um, and we had a question from, we have a few questions here, uh, from Stacy. She asks, was, Man, was Manfred von Richthofen a part of the air reconnaissance over this area? Um, Not that, this time. He was at Ulen, he was a cavalry guy. And then he saw the light and he became an aviator, but that was in 1915. But guess where he flew his first sorties out? He flew over the Russian front. And he, uh, in our book too, uh, we comment on what Ron Leifelfen experiences because he's, a, he's an aerial observer at first. He doesn't, fly the, he doesn't fly the airplane yet. He has to basically earn his spurs by figuring out what's down below. But that was in 1915. I think it was on like May of 15. So, and I think he flew as far as Baranovici, which was the Russian headquarters at the time on the Eastern front. Anybody else? Uh, Steve, you had a question. Do you want me to ask it from the chat or do you want to ask it yourself? I, I, I can ask it myself, thank you. Sure. Um, Who is this guy? I don't know, I've never seen him before. <laughs> <laughs> I bought one of your books once. <laughs> um, yeah, babe. In, uh, you, you made the fascinating point about aerial reconnaissance being directed yeah. And, and wireless intercepts being random. Yes. Make, therefore, making the aerial reconnaissance more useful. Um, what, what I wondered, though, was, um, was there 
was there a contradiction in what the two sources were saying or was or were they similar well what you have steve is you have the, uh, the wireless picking up transmissions as you and i know from our decades and then they needed to validate was what they heard actually being observed and say so they would generate the sorties because this is the amazing thing about the tannenberg experience they they got wise fast to how they needed to operate so as they got the transmission they tasked whatever um Feldflieger Eptelander was to do the sortie, come back, either drop a message or land near the headquarters with the information. <clears throat> so that task and capability made a major difference in terms of the way that aerial reconnaissance was observed and appreciated by commanders. Because as you know, when you hear something, <clears throat> okay, is that really the truth? Are they playing deception games? And they were playing deception games after a few days the Russians realize that, oh, wait a minute, you know, we're screwing up bad. At least let's have some ability to do what we've got to do in terms of put the wool over the Germans' eyes. So we have a, one description in the book about a deception that was uh, chronologically applied. Other than that, um, it's a fascinating discussion because there's always the, an argument as to who won the Battle of Tannenberg. And what I see from looking at the consistency day in, day out over the entire campaign leading up to the expulsion of the Russians from East Prussia, post Prussian, is aviation was extensively employed successfully. Because flying a Talba, as you can imagine, wasn't the most structurally sound airplane, but it did the job. And that's the thing that amazes all of us, those A-frame, airplanes, the, the Taubas and such, they were all pre-war designed. And then you have the biplanes coming on just as the war starting. The LVG that the 8th Army uh, failed to figure out to the 16 was flying, looks like a, a very impressive airplane at its time. So they had the ability to fly the longer sorties because they were much better built. But the aviators were flying the Taubas were equally brave. And I think that's where Francois made a point of recognizing his aviators for doing the right job. Now, I'm tired of talking about aerial reconnaissance. Let's talk about aerial bombardment. I think that's more exciting. Don't you agree? <laughs> uh, so actually, we do have a, a, a question maybe sort of uh, sort of in that realm uh, from Glenn. Um, he's asking, how vulnerable were um, the multi-engine planes to the single-engine fighters? Well, we're talking late 15. You have one airplane in the skies. Well, I take it back, Caproni. Uh, in Italy had built a three engine around the time of the start of the war. But the only one on the Eastern front was the Ile Miramets. So most of your airplanes flying in the Eastern front were single engine, be it tractor pole or pusher. So that's the configuration. We can go into detail on how each airplane performed, but for the most part, um, the answer to this question, Multi-engine didn't really come into its own until mid-war. German Stockens and Gotha bombers and stuff like that really came around about 15, late 15 or 16. Well, I have a little point about the Tauba. It was, um, it was a really primitive aircraft in that it used wing warping rather yeah. than uh, flaps or anything like that, like ailerons. Right. So it was even more susceptible to uh, the vicissitudes of the wind and things like that. So it was really, really, I mean, it was a wonder that they actually flew. <laughs> well, you know, actually, you had the same uh -oh. instance with the Eindecker, uh, and they were quite successful as a fighter, your first fighter. So uh, <clears throat> there's a lot to be said. The problem was, is that the design on the Talba is that it was a very stable aircraft and its observation area was not as good because the wing uh, comprised enough of the fuselage that it prevented a good downward view, which was often the problem with mid-wing uh, monoplanes. And that's why the biplanes turned out to be better, especially when they started using cameras. I wonder if they ever thought of cutting a hole in the Taba's fuselage to let the observer look Look downwards. There was some modifications, and you can see that 
as aviators started to, to find out what they needed to do, um, the Army, right, like the British primary observation plane for most of the world was the BE-2. Yeah. And the observer basically sat in front with the wings to look over. So, but to answer your question, by the way, that mystery voice out of the, out of the background is my co-author, Carl Barbaro, emeritus from National Air and Space. Uh, so his work on the Russian piece is standalone. We dug so deep and Carl has uncovered information that never has been touched in a hundred years. And it's now in the case of volume one and he's now leading the charge of volume two, which is the Southwestern Front. But to answer your question, Chandra, about the wing warping, think back to 1903 when a guy in Orville and Wilbur Wright flew the first airplane, which was wing warping. So take it from there. Yeah. Uh, all right, we have time for maybe just one, one more question, maybe one, one more question from the audience, if anyone has one. And if not, I have one from the chat. Yeah. Why oh, were the two Russian armies not within supporting distance in the first place? Well, that's a fascinating comment. You know what happened was, you look at the map, you see first army to the north, you see second army coming in from the south. There's a 70 kilometer gap. And Hoffman picks it up. He says, hey, the Russians are not tied together. They're not working together. And we have an opportunity to exploit this gap. This is where Pritvitz fails. He didn't push intelligence to the max. He didn't take advantage of that opportunity. And so when Hindenburg and Ludendorff show up, Hoffman talks to them and says, this is what we're seeing. They make the decision, since those two armies aren't talking to each other because they have a 70 kilometer gap, let's maneuver our forces south. Let's destroy second army and then we'll take on first army after we do the first thing with second. So yes, uh, fascinating discovery over time because of thanks to reconnaissance setting up the battlefield. All right, Melanie, I'd like to know, uh, say something before that we conclude. Again, to thank Terry for a more than brilliant presentation. But I just want to say this is that he's covered what the air has done. Our next speaker in September, on the 11th of September, well, his name is Dennis Kapinski. He's going to talk about how railroads made a difference in World War I. Now we're on the air, we'll be back on land uh, and on that, discussing that issue. The other thing is I need speakers, please, and pres presenters. I need one for October, November, and December to end the year. Please give me someone. <laughs> I'll take care of the one in January. I usually do, but not those three months. I need speakers. Come on, people. Give me a call. Give me something. Anyway, give me a call to let me know. Contact Melanie. She'll tell you how to get a hold of me best. Take care, everyone. Thanks, and Terry. Aloha. Thank you. Uh, thanks, everyone. I put the email association address in here. We did have some problems with the address in July. So if you if you emailed me in July, uh, I might not have gotten it. We were having some problems with the server. So uh, <laughs> maybe you could try. It's fixed now. So you could try again. <laughs> Asal, would you maybe you want to put your your uh, number as well, I can include this. All right, I can give you my, my phone number. That's the best way to get a hold of me. Mm -hmm. All right, it'd be 510-570-7668. Yeah, put that in the chat as well, if anyone wants to take it down. Thank you, Terry. Aloha, take much. care. Bye. Thanks, Terry, Bye, thanks everyone. Thank you. Have Thank a good you, weekend. Melanie. Thanks, Paul. And thanks, Melanie, for a brilliant job, too. Take care. Yeah. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Okay, we actually probably do this now.